spend our time in this short period dealing with four works by one of the most prolific and interesting authors of the 18th century, Daniel Defoe. Daniel Defoe was born in 1660, died in 1731, lived and lived through the tempestuous times of the exchange of kings and the assertion, assertion of the Tory government and the high church. He was of a dissenting family and was Presbyterian. Therefore, he was a Whig in politics. During the insurrection of the Duke of Monmouth, he actually was involved in the army and was involved in some of the action. But when the Duke of Monmouth lost, he crept away or he filtered himself away under the guise of a brickmaker. And even when he was in battle, his family thought that he was out either selling bricks or trying to develop contracts for bricks or gaining uh, substance for brick making. He was a supporter of William III because of William III's Protestant leanings. And he turned out to be one of the leading journalists of the 18th century, one of the leading essayists of the 18th century. One estimate has that he published 570 works during his lifetime. That has been more recently modified. But he did write more poetry than John Milton, who wrote Paradise Lost when Defoe was seven years old. Let's just look briefly at some of the works that he did. Today we're going to look at the essay upon projects in which he develops a host of ideas for modernizing England. He was upset because people criticized the Whigs, I mean criticized the dissenters. He was upset because people criticized particularly William III, uh, I'm sorry, yes, William III, who was from Holland. Because he was a Dutchman, he was looked upon as a foreigner. And in the true born Englishman, which we're going to discuss today, uh, Defoe says, all Englishmen are essentially foreigners and ought to understand that and respect William III, even though his wife has passed away, the Stuart, and he sits on the throne alone as King of England. In 1702, he wrote a book, uh, an essay called The Shortest Way with Dissenters. It was an ironic statement about how to get rid of dissenters. But he wrote it. He fooled a lot of people who, who thought that it was written by a churchman and a Tory, and they were so infuriated, they threw him in jail for it. When he was in jail, one of the consequences was that he was going to be sentenced to the pillory for three days. So to ward off being sentenced to the pillory, or sitting in the pillory, he wrote a poem called A Hymn to the Pillory, where he celebrated the pillory as a place where good men were sentenced by people with evil intentions. We'll talk a little bit more about that. He wrote entirely a magazine published three times a week from 1714, from 1704 to 1713 called The Review. And we have a complete set in our library. If you wish to study it, write about it, you're welcome to do so. In 1713, he wrote a book called The Family Instructor. Excuse me, that's an error. It should be 1714. He wrote a book called The Family Instructor. What was that for? Queen Anne had ruled that no dissenter could teach religion in his home anymore, except by penalty of a jail sentence. And even though Parliament objected to it, they passed it because of Queen Anne's wishes. Defoe wrote The Family Instructor because books were not forbidden in people's homes. And so he wrote that to allow the dissenters to bring into their home an instructor who had not been forbidden. Uh, Queen Anne died on the day the law went into effect and no one ever enforced it. And by the time Defoe wrote the second family instructor in 1718, uh, no one was 
being restricted from practicing religion in their homes. Now, Defoe is mo most noted for writing Robinson Crusoe, probably the most famous book in the world, other than the Bible, and probably the book that is uh, most translated in all languages of the world. Robinson Crusoe, the man who saw a footprint in the sand when he was on a deserted island, was so popular that he published a sequel in the same year called The Farther Adventures of Robinson Crusoe, in which he discusses Crusoe's travels throughout the world to China and to Russia. And that was so popular, he published a more philosophical book called The Serious Reflections of Robinson Crusoe in 1720. I mean, if you talk about sequels to movies today, Rocky 1, Rocky 2, and Rocky 3, here was a hit novel that continued to sell massive copies. Then he began to write novels. He was out of the political fray. He wrote Memoirs of Cal Cavalier in 1720. He wrote a novel called Captain Singleton in the same year. He wrote Maul Flanders, the story of a woman deprived of her virtue who has it restored at the end of the novel. He wrote the Journal of the Plague Year describing the great last plague of London when he was only four years old, which occurred in 1664, but he puts it in the first person and we feel as though we are there uh, during this plague. He wrote Colonel Jack. Colonel Jack was a man who was an, became an indentured servant to a slave owner in America and he taught the slave owner to treat the slaves gently and he would get more production out of them. The slave owner didn't believe it, but he let Captain Jack go ahead with it. And he was so successful that when uh, Captain Jack's indentured service period ran out, his, uh, the landholder, the plantation owner, gave Colonel Jack his own piece of land and a parcel of slaves that he could rule over. And both of them maintained a productive uh, uh, estates but by treating their slaves well instead of cruelly. He wrote a book, he toured England, and one of the massive books of the time that deals with travels throughout England during the time is his tour through Great Britain. Two books are rather, the, the Complete English Tradesman gives us an idea of mercantilism in the 18th century, but two works are very of interest, you ought to note, one is the political history of the devil. The first part deals with the devil during biblical times. The second deals with the devil during modern times. And what is Defoe's thesis? It's a very interesting thesis. He says the devil has been away from earth for 400 years and returns to discover people committing all kinds of heinous, devious, and sinful acts and blaming them on him without having consulted him. And furthermore, he discovers that human beings are capable of far more evil actions than he himself could ever have conceived. So what Defoe, a dissenter, a Presbyterian tolerantist, is actually saying is that people on free will and people on their own volition are committing acts and ought to stop them on their own volition. And his last book, or one of his last books, Conjugal Lewdness, is an advocacy of divorce laws. He claims that more rapes occur in marriage than out of marriage. And therefore, women should have the right to gain divorce if they no longer want to live with brutalizing and terrorizing husbands. Well, this is a man with incredible capability. And uh, one of the people, by the way, who really liked the family instructor was Benjamin Franklin when he was printing in America. Now, let's look at the first book we have in mind for today, and that is Daniel Defoe's Essay on Projects. Now, the Essay on Projects, your book says that your book, which was published in 1999, 
says that there is no new edition of Daniel Defoe's works available, no definitive edition. I'm pleased to tell you that the University of Houston is involved in the production of a complete edition of at least 40 of Defoe's works. Uh, let me just show you what we're involved with so you know where you are and you know what the university is doing. We're publishing a collection of books called the Stoke Newington Daniel Defoe Edition. This is the essay on projects which came out in 1999. Uh, the Consolidator came out in 2001. In the year 2003, we produced an edition of the political history of the devil. But here are the people who are involved in this project, just to give you some idea how widespread it is. Jim Bork from LSU is a member of this publishing team. Joyce Kennedy from Mount St. Stephen University in Nova Scotia is part of our publishing team. John Peters, the University of North Texas, is part of this publishing team. I'm involved in as, the, as one of the editors and the uh, textual bibliographer, the uh, chief textual bibliographer of these works. I have to look at every edition and try to figure out what's printed correctly, what's printed uh, incorrectly, and how this compares, how the first edition compares with subsequent editions. Michael Seidel from Columbia University is involved and Manuel Schoenhorn from Southern Illinois University is involved. The project is massive. It involves a lot of student help, and we've solicited student help in the past. And any of you who is interested in participating in this Defoe publishing project, let me know. There's a lot of work you can do for us. And it's a legitimate publishing project and very important in modern scholarship. Now, when Defoe published the essay on projects in 1697, he had a number of topics that he dealt with. We're going to look at two here, only one of which is in your text. He was concerned with how you sponsor scientists. Scientists are called projectors in the 18th century. And he himself wrote a book called The Consolidator, which deals with a moon journey. This was not a scientific report, but it was based on scientific research being conducted in the Royal Academy. He was concerned with banks. Until about the first, century, first decade of the 18th century, uh, we had no concept of a national debt. A, a king, if he wanted to build a highway, had to find enough money to build it immediately. The idea of a national debt that you should build a highway and then let people who use it over the next 40 years pay for it was relatively new. In fact, Jonathan Swift in Gulliver's Travels refers to it. Gulliver has mentioned to the giant king, the Brobdenagian king, about banking and the uh, uh, concepts of debt. And the king says, how is it possible for you to spend more money than you have in your pocket? He doesn't understand it. Well, we're all living with expenses beyond our pockets because of uh, uh, the ability to develop projects with long-term debts. There are friendly societies. What do you do with seamen who no longer have jobs or have lost their jobs? And what do you do with widows who have no support and no money. Can you set up state institutions to help support them? By the way, in the 18th century, one out of eight, eight people was on the dole. That is, one out of eight people received some kind of aid from the state or the parish. We're much better off. The ratio in the United States today is about 1 to 16. So we've improved by far the numbers of people who are self-dependent. Uh, he asked for an institution for fools. That means an insane asylum. What kind of institution do you have? For people who look healthy, who walk about healthy, who seem healthy, but whose minds are so disturbed that they no longer can fit in society. And he uses the word fools, but not in a way to disparage people. It's just a term 
he used. If you can't, if you can't figure out events on a daily basis, then you are proceeding foolishly. He advocates a lottery for fools. Have a lottery in England, and that'll pay for the cost of institutions. He supports a royal academy for military exercises. He's one of the first to advocate an institution like West Point. And then he advocates an academy for women that we're going to discuss today. He also has a problem with sailors. In the 18th century, there was a problem. Sometimes there weren't enough sailors at port to unload ships or to load ships. Because people, when the ships weren't in port, had to look for jobs, and when they had other jobs, they couldn't unload ships. So he was advocating a policy whereby you would pay them a small stipend, a subsidy, almost a, an advanced pension, for sailors just to sit about the docks waiting for something to happen. They wouldn't be working, but they would be paid to do this. What do you think about that, Miss Luck? Press the button when you, so you can talk. Do you think we should pay people for not working, for just sitting there waiting until the ship comes in? You shake your head, no. Mr. Taft, what do you think? I said we do that now. We do? Where? Uh, welfare? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, welfare doesn't exact jobs from people. If you give people welfare, they're obliged to stay with their children at home, or they're obliged to stay with a sick person, but they're not necessarily sitting on the dock waiting for a, a job to open up. Well, but they're, they're sitting down, but they're not waiting for a job to open up. <laughs> Some are not, yes. Ms. Mortimer? Um, oftentimes, teachers have their salary averaged out so that they're getting paid over the summer while they're not working. It's, it's the same thing. Oh, that's an interesting statement. Yes, sir. Announce your name. I just can't see oh, on the list. Scott. All right. Well, major corporations actually have people that are, are what, what are called on the bench, which means that they just sit around waiting for the next big project to come around. And that's basically what they do, is they sit around on the bench. And when people are done, they go on the bench and just wait around and pay for that. Where do you sign up for that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Terry. Uh, we've got something called the uh, Army Reserves. <laughs> well, but you have to go to meetings in the Army Reserve. And, and if you're going to be called up, you'll be called up and you'll, you're expected to fight, right? Yeah. But, but you're not sitting down doing nothing. But they get paid, you know, while they're not, you know, fighting overseas. I mean, they get trained, but then they're just kind of back up, like, like what he's proposing here. Right, right. Uh, I did that when I was in the National Guard. But at one point I was sitting in the armory with a thousand other men waiting to be for troops to go into Cuba if the Russian ship passed the right point. It didn't have turned around so we were let go. But we were ready to go. But we had been we were in regular training every week. No, these are all interesting ideas. One interesting aspect is this, that several years ago the port of Houston actually had a shortage of sailors and stevedores to unload the docks. And the proposal did float in the state of providing them with a stipend so they could bring in people who were seamen, who were stevedores, who would sit in the Union Hall until it was time for, until a ship came in. So the issue that Defoe is descri describing here is not any different than the issues we're facing today. The mercantilism he is supporting is no different than the mercantilism we are supporting today. And the heavy traffic in the docks is no different than we're in enjoying today. And when the ships aren't in, uh, and you, when you don't know when they're coming in, you really have to have people available. I don't know how they've solved that problem at the Houston port, but indeed it was a viable concern several years ago, and people were searching for answers such as the very answers that Defoe advocated. Now, when Defoe asked to build highways, highways were, we don't have highways in uh, 
England in the 18th century, you have mud roads outside of London. And what Defoe was advocating was building highways from London every way at least 10 miles out and the roads were to be built 40 feet wide and 4 foot high with ditches to carry drainage 8 foot broad and 6 foot deep. So you had to build up the highway, so you had a highway and then you had to move it in all directions out of London at least 10 miles. Now, a, a 10 miles doesn't seem like a lot in Houston. But if you go to Boston, 10 miles out, you're at a, uh, Medford, Massachusetts already. And five miles out, you're, that is, cities are very close together in dense areas. How are you going to pave these streets? He suggested the streets be paved with stone, chalk, or gravel. He also suggested the possibility of having slave labor come in to build these highways. And uh, he said that you could hire slaves at half the cost of regular workers. Now you have to understand that when Robinson Crusoe was shipwrecked, he was on a slaver. And Robinson Crusoe was very wealthy because he had, in fact, in Brazil, established a plantation with partners where he uh, produced goods. So the slave trade was very interesting to uh, Defoe, who wrote about the Royal African Company. The Royal African Company was in charge of bringing slaves from the various forts, and their trade was being interrupted by privateers who were taking the slaves and paying a higher price than the Royal African Company I was doing. Defoe advocated that all these privateers who took slaves that were for the Royal African Company be forced to pay a 10% fee for the right to pick up slaves. And it becomes part of the history of the times. Let's look under the military academy that Defoe proposed. What did he want to teach people? He wanted to teach them geometry, astronomy, history, navigation, decimal arithmetic, trigonometry, dialing, how to check directions, gauging, mining, how do you, how do you plan mines, how do you develop fireworks, how do you bombard, what kinds of gunnery do you use, what kinds of fortification, how do you encamp how do you entrench? How do you approach the enemy? How do you attack the enemy? What is the architecture of military development? And what, what do they need in order to survey the land? Well, you can't be... You've got to be fairly bright to be in the military if you have to learn all this material. Not to say that the period, most people in the military at the time were illiterate, but they were learning a great deal, and Defoe was advocating an academy to teach the officers how to develop an army. What should soldiers be able to do according to Defoe? They should be able to swim, which no soldier, and indeed no man whatever, ought to be without. They should learn how to handle all sorts of firearms, how they should march and counter march in form, how to fence and use the long staff, how to ride and manage horses, and how to run, leap, and wrestle. This is all part of the essay on projects. But the one we're most interested in today is the Academy of Women. Defoe was married. He had children, daughters. He, uh, he had a wife who protected him and who hoped that he could raise enough money to support the family. He wanted people to gain an education. And he saw that women were oppressed and women were put down. He says, I have often thought of it as one of the most barbarous 
customs in the world, considering us as a civilized and Christian country, that we deny the advantages of learning to women. The essay goes on. He says, but why then should women, women be denied the benefit of instruction? If knowledge and understanding had been useless additions to the sex, God Almighty would never have given them capacities. For he made nothing needless. This is almost a theological lesson. These are partners. The first evidence of man and woman in the Hebrew scripture says God created she and him together. And then the rib episode is an older episode that comes a little later. But the partnership is understood. And Defoe, who is a very strict religionist, there's very little that Defoe writes that doesn't have religious implications because he has read the Bible and he knows it intimately, he quotes it. In fact, he quotes it intimately and sometimes he quotes it incorrectly, but only in terms of the ver verbiage being different from the original text. Not, not, he's not unfamiliar with the text. He says, besides, I would ask such what they can see in ignorance that they should think it a necessary ornament to a woman. Or what has the woman done to forfeit the privilege of being taught? Now his Academy for Women, while it's restricted to women, is not anywhere near the concept of the convent that Mary Estelle offers. His is a more modern and more integrative uh, type of environment. And here it becomes part of the religious advocacy. The soul is placed in the body like a rough diamond and must be polished or the luster of it will never appear. So every human being deserves an education. Every human being ought not be ignorant. Every human being ought to have the opportunity to understand what there is to understand. Among the issues women should be taught, music, dancing, French, so they have various languages, Italian, rhetoric, and history. They should be able to write well, they should be able to write with articulation. They should know the classic forms. They should be able to give us a sense of the past and the present. Uh, and as you begin reading this discussion of the Academy of Women, you get an idea that Daniel Defoe, in this essay on projects, has come up with a series of projects that any politician would do well who wishes to change, modernize, and uh, improve uh, and modernize in his, his society. All right, let's look on. He goes on to say, as he speaks about modernizing society, integrating women into intellectual society, he says, and herein it is that I take upon me to make such a bold assertion that all the world are mistaken in their practice about women. For I cannot think that God Almighty ever made them so delicate, so glorious creatures, and furnished them with such charms, so agreeable and delightful to mankind, with souls capable of the same accomplishments with men, and all to be only stewards of our houses, cooks, and slaves. Powerful, powerful writing. When you look in your text at the discussion of the Academy of Women, he divides it in the kinds of lives people should lead, the kinds of buildings that should be erected for these schools,
And he talks about the kinds of women who, in fact, should gain an education. Why do people object to women's getting an education? If you look on page 495 of your text, you see some statements here. She says, want of education makes her soft and easy. And education makes her hard and knowledgeable. If she has wit, she becomes uh, impertinent and talkative. If she has knowledge, she becomes fanciful and whimsical. If she has a bad temper, her education will just make her more haughty, insolent, and loud. If she is passionate, her education will make her more passionate. And if she is proud, she will become conceited, fantastic, and ridiculous. These are arguments against giving women education. And Defoe is a very, very good writer. What does he do? He offers an argument. He presents a position. He answers the critics. He recapitulates his argument and he summarizes his ideas just as you have done on papers you've submitted to class. If anyone has any comments about Defoe's attitude toward the education of women, I'd be glad to entertain them. He is a good voice. He's a liberal voice, and he's a voice that understands the importance of education in this time, when perhaps 95 to 97 percent of the women were essentially illiterate. He saw no need for it. The true born Englishman is one of Defoe's uh, major poems. William III was considered to be a foreigner. He was a Dutchman. As long as his wife was alive, and she was a Stuart, the daughter of James II, people supported him. Once she died and he was alone, this foreigner on the throne of England, he began to undergo such great criticism that he himself felt at some point that he would resign. He would abandon this position. Defoe was one of his ardent supporters. And Defoe challenges Englishmen who cast doubt upon the reign of William III. Now let's look at this for a few moments, a few details of this poem. The style of the poem is in Hudibrastic rhymes. Samuel Butler's Hudibras was a, an attack upon the Presbyterian fanatics of Oliver Cromwell. And one of the characteristics of Hudibrastic rhyme is that it's funny, it's tricky, and it's light. But it's also bitterly satirical. For example, one of his poems... He begins the poem, if you look on line one. Wherever God erects a house of prayer, the devil always builds a chapel there. So you're always going to have opposition to good works. Now, house, house of prayer is four syllables. A chapel there is four syllables. It takes a certain bit of agility to make this rhyme work. It's a polysyllabic rhyme. Furthermore, a rhyme generally is important, is good when it ends with a stressed vowel. So it should end with, all right, the word er, the, the syllable er on prayer is an unstressed syllable. Pray is stressed, er is unstressed. 
Therefore, you end each line with an unstressed syllable. It's called a weak rhyme. When you end with a weak rhyme, it's either humorous or intended to denigrate or reduce the quality of the statement being made. So while we have a house of prayer, the devil makes a chapel there, and you see this rhythm going. Look at this line, the devil. He knows the genius and the inclination and matches proper sins for every nation. Now, inclination ends with an unstressed vowel. In, cle, ne is stressed, shun is unstressed. Ne is stressed, shun is unstressed. Therefore, you have what we call weak rhymes at the end of the sentence, and these are hudibrastic, because inclination rhymes with for every nation. Now, when you're looking for just cheap rhymes, you have... The, uh, I think that I shall never see a picture lovely as a tree, right? Those are cheap rhymes. You know, you know what the rhyme is going to be. One word rhymes with one word. Or Walt Whitman wrote a, uh, a captain, my captain. Have I mentioned that in this class already? Okay, we're not going to do it again. Well, what happens in this poem? What he's trying to do is show that most people in England are looking out for their own interests. And when they complain about foreigners, they don't understand that the nation has been comprised of foreigners. I always think of T.S. Eliot, who considered America a wasteland. And what a misconception he had. He thought America was a wasteland because millions of immigrants were coming from uh, Poland and from Russia from France and from Germany trying to make a life and to leave the military and the oligarchic oppression in those countries under the Tsar and under the uh, dictators of Europe. And he thought that these rabble were coming huddled masses to the shore and he didn't respect them, he didn't understand them. He thought America was being uh, mongrelized. And so he left and became a citizen in England and he wrote a poem saying that America was a wasteland. But this wasteland produced some of the greatest writers, some of the, some of the early uh, uh, movie producers and some of the great inventors of our society. Uh, Eliot didn't understand that. Now, what Defoe is doing is defending here William III and any foreigner who has come to England uh, as well. He says that the devil is always present, lines 1 to 26. People, he says, suffer the sin of pride, lines 27 to 39, and the sin of lust from lines 40 to 50. People are immersed in drunkenness. And these are the kinds of people who are ruling this nation. But first of all, he tries to attribute to the various countries of the world various characteristics that represent human misery or human poverty. He attributes to Spain pride at line 27. Pride, the first peer and president of hell, to his share Spain, the largest province fell. The saddle prince thought fittest to bestow on these the golden mines of Mexico. To bestow on Mexico gold and pride is the devil's work. What else has the devil done? At line 41, Italy Lust chose the torrid zone of, zone of Italy. All right, lust chose the torrid zone of Italy where blood ferments in rapes and sodomy. Well, of Italy and sodomy become a hudibrastic grime. But Defoe is showing that the rest of the world isn't so peaceful. Satan rules the pagan world at 67. The pagan world, he blindly leads away 
and personally rules with arbitrary sway. So people in generally, general, in the countries of the world are being influenced by the devil in this poem. And of course, Defoe's purpose is to show that uh, these nations have influenced England. They've brought people to England. And they've brought vices to England. Then he goes into the history of England. When he says rude England is subject to conquest, he doesn't mean it's impolite. He means it, the word refers to ruddy people who work in the fields. And so lines 110 and to 111 give us the first conquest of England. When foreigners came in, look at line 110. This is the devil working. He made her firstborn race to be so rude and suffered her to be so oft subdued by several crowds of wandering thieves or run often unpeopled and as oft undone. Line 120, we have Roman rule of England. The Romans first with Julius Caesar came, including all the nations of the name, Gauls, Greeks, and Lombards, and by computation, auxiliaries or slaves of every nation. Computation rhymes with of every nation. When you're writing this, these poems, when, when Defoe is writing, he's thinking about concepts. He's not thinking of single words to rhyme. The Norman conquest is at line 140. The great invading Norman let us know what conquerors in after times might do. To every musketeer he brought to town, he gave the lands which never were his own. So all these people came from France under William the Conqueror, and they gained access to lands that were not theirs to own. So the first, the Romans came in, then the Gauls came in. Who else comes in to conquer England? Look at line 170, where Defoe says, because the English come from so many different backgrounds, as, as so many different nations, he says a Turkish horse can show more history to prove his well-descended family. At least the Turks nurture their horses, identify their pedigrees, trace their background. The English can't even do that. And then he gets even more sarcastic to follow line 179. These are the heroes that despise the Dutch and rail at newcome foreigners so much, forgetting that themselves are all derived from the most scoundrel race that ever lived. A horrid medley of thieves and drones who ransacked kingdoms and dispeopled towns. Now, I'm going to read this a little differently. I'm reading it more anglicized. And it looks as though a number of these rhymes don't work. The reason they don't work is because we're not accustomed to 18th century English speech. And it has to be read more toward the Irish. So I'm going to read a few of these lines again, just to give you some idea of how to read them to make them rhyme. Don't tell me the words don't rhyme. It's just a matter of understanding what, how linguistic patterns have changed. Um, Go to line 178. These are the heroes that despise the Dutch and rail at newcome foreigners so much, forgetting that themselves are all derived from the most scoundrel race that ever lived, a horrid medley of thieves and drones who ransack kingdoms and dispeopled towns, the picked and patent Britain treacherous sought by hunger, theft, and rapine, hither brought. Norwegian pirates, buccaneering Danes, 
whose red-haired offspring everywhere remains, who joined with Norman French, compound the braid from whence your true-born Englishmen proceed. Pick up the Irish and you get the rhyme. Right, Miss Clark? Good. Line 204, Defoe talks about the advantage of having foreigners in your country. He says, Dutch, Wallons, Flemings, Irishmen, and Scots, Vaudois, and Valtolins, and Huguenots, in good Queen Bess's charitable reign, supplied us with 300,000 men. Religion. God, we thank thee, sent them hither, priests, Protestants, the devil, and all together. So everyone came together to help defend the country against the French, against the Spanish. There were no divisions. Now he talks about what happened to England when Charles II came to the throne. Remember in Absalom and Achitophel, we have the situation where Charles had many wives and you had a loose court. Look at 234. Line 234. Who are the people who claim that the nobility People who are granted tire, uh, titles, who are thieves, who are crooks, who are womanizers. People are given titles who are bastard children of royalty. He says, look at you Englishmen. You're corrupt and you're finding faults with people coming into your country. You have no identity. Your identity is whatever you want it to be. Throughout his, throughout his lazy, long, lascivious reign with such a blessed and true-born English fry as much illustrates our nobility. Who are our nobility? Here they are. A gratitude which will so black appear as future ages must abhor to hear when they look back on all that crimson flood which streamed in Lindsay's and Carnarvon's blood. Bold Strafford, Cambridge, Capel, Lucas, Lyle, these are all people he's naming who, who achieved high position, who crowned in death his father's funeral pile, the loss of whom, in order to supply with true born English nobility, six bastard dukes survive his luscious reign, the labors of Italian Castlemaine. Who are your nobility? Who are your aristocrats? Bastards born of lust? He says, let's understand that all of us are in the same boat together. The English nature, nation is a conglomerate of peoples from all races, religions. Well, he doesn't say religions. He would like to say that, but he knows that the English government wouldn't accept that. He says, even England brought to its lands Huguenots who are fleeing the re religious oppression of the Roman Catholics in France. Line 263. Then to recruit the commons he prepares and heals the latent, latent breaches of the wars. The pious purpose better to advance. He invites the banished Protestants of France. Hither for God's sake and their own they fled some for religion, and some came for bread. So there were religious wars, but others just wanted work. Others just wanted jobs. And as we talk about the borders of the United States and migrants coming in to do work, we are faced with the same issues 
At what point should they be allowed to be citizens? At what point should they, should they be integrated into the society? And who are the people who are going to denigrate their existence and denigrate their presence in our society? What is the real English character, he says. The wonder which remains is that our pride to value that which all wise men deride. For Englishmen to boast of generation cancels their knowledge and lampoons the nation. A true-born Englishman's a contradiction in speech and irony in fact, a fiction. You know, if you're going to say, my family was here for 800 years, Defoe is saying, in speech, it's an irony because it's not true. In fact, it's a fiction. A banter made to be a test of fools, which those that use it justly ridicules. A true-born Englishman, he said, is a metaphor invented to express a man akin to the universe. Everyone's a true-born Englishman, if you get down to it. And finally, he says, <laughs> the irony is, but England, modern to the last degree, borrows or makes her own nobility. We're going to look at two other works that are important today. One is The Shortest Way with Dissenters. In 1702, Defoe wrote an ironic statement. And it's really very, very important. What he said was, there is a move out to reduce dissenters, to prevent them from practicing the religion, to enforce the Test Act, which says you must subscribe to the Book of Common Prayer. And what Defoe says is, people want to get rid of us. They want to get rid of dissenters. There was a man by the name of Sacheverell, a clergyman, who literally was a rabble rouser and was leading crowds, in fact, to a. Uh, uh, he was he was creating a frenzy of mobs intended to punish, to beat, and to harm dissenters. What did Defoe do here? He wrote an irony. Now, an irony is when you read an, an ironic statement, you look at it. And you have to understand that it means the opposite. Now, when Defoe wrote this essay, The Shortest Way of Dissenters, he put on the guise of a Tory and high churchman who said, we've got to get rid of these dissenters. So it's called covert irony, because you don't recognize who the real speaker is or what the real purpose is until you get deeply into it. Secondly, it's a local irony. It deals with specific political problems in the country or in the area that can be identified. And finally, it's a stable irony, because whatever happens in this irony, if you think the opposite, is the voice of the author. When the narrator expresses the voice of the author, you have a stability. So you're always looking to see whether the narrator is expressing the views of the author, to what extent is this a localized irony, and to what extent do we understand its meaning. Henry Sacheverell, here's his name, spelled S-A-C-H-E-V-E-R-E-L-L. -E 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 he was the rabble rouser who was turning people and forcing and, and urging them to brutalize the uh, dissenters. Now, the person who's speaking this essay, the person whose voice you're hearing, 
is the voice of a high Tory Anglican. I mean, a Tory high church Anglican who is condemning the dissenters. Now, remember, the dissenters are Presbyterians. They executed Charles I under Cromwell. Then... Uh, then they deposed James II because he was Roman Catholic. They forced his deposition. And here is the speaker. A high church Tory saying, you have butchered one king, the dissenters. You have deposed another king and made a mock king of the third. That's William III. And yet you could have the face to expect to be employed and trusted by the fourth Anybody that did not know the temper of your part would stand amazed at the impudence as well as folly to think of it. We don't want dissenters here. You're dishonest. You're brutal. You're going to tear down this world, this English world we hope to keep. The voice again says, Had King James sent all the Puritans in England away to the West Indies, we had been a national unmixed church the Church of England had been kept undivided and entire. If he just got rid of all these people, what a nice unified country would have. All English, true born Englishmen, number one, and all Anglican. Then the speaker says, why do the dissenters think they have to stay? Number one, they say they are numerous and cannot be depressed. And they are needed to assist the country in the event of war. The author of this essay then goes along to undermine all positions that the dissenters might pose to defend their place in society. Now, Anglicans, High Anglicans, and Tories liked this essay. They said, that's what we ought to do. We ought to get rid of these dissenters. And this fellow is speaking the right thing. And here's what the conclusion was. What's the conclusion? Now, says the author, let us crucify the thieves. Let us crucify these dissenters. Let her foundations be established upon the destruction of her enemies. We're going to have an England that's going to destroy these people. The doors of mercy being always open to the returning part of the deluded people. Let the obstinate be ruled with the rod of iron. Let us kill these dissenters. Now remember, there are three million dissenters in England. Almost as many Anglicans. People were thrilled with this essay. Someone finally saying what they thought in their hearts. And then they discovered it was written by Daniel Defoe. Not only was it written by Daniel Defoe, but Daniel Defoe was a Whig, and Daniel Defoe was a Presbyterian. So the whole thing was a big joke, an ironic attack upon those people who wanted to get rid of dissenters and didn't understand their place in society. The ruling class became so furious with Defoe that he was fined and sentenced to stand in the stocks one hour each of three days, July 29th, 30th, and 31, 1703, and sent to prison. That's how insulted they were by a Presbyterian Whig posing as a Tory high churchman and putting out a, a statement that they thought was viable when he was only ridiculing them. Now, when you stood in the pillory in the 18th century, your head was between two boards and you were out of the law. People could throw fruit at you. People could throw rocks at you. And people died in the pillory. People died in the pillory. If you were especially guilty of a heinous crime, 
your ear would be nailed to the pillory. So that when people began to throw objects at you and you instinctively pulled away, you would tear out your ear and you could bleed to death in the pillory. The Pharaoh was deathly afraid of standing in the pillory. So he wrote a poem in prison, which we're not going to look at, called A Hymn to the Pillory. And what does he do in that poem? He first of all says, Many people have stood in this pillory far more worthy than he and far less guilty of crimes than he may be accused of. And he lists them. And then he goes on to say, who should be in this pillory? Let's look at the long range of figures who never are sentenced to the pillory, who ought to be there. Among them, admirals who send a shipload of sailors to sea in battle and from shore watch the ships blow up each other and a thousand sailors sink to the bottom of the ocean. Or military commanders who know the battle is lost but need time to bring up more forces. So they send men and women into the battle knowing they're going to be killed only to delay the arrival of fresh troops and the possibility of victory. And what Defoe does in the hymn to the pillory is gather among his friends people who chose to stand around the pillory when he was in it and prevent anyone from hurting him. Defoe went to jail for two years. How did he get out? They didn't know in the 18th century and they didn't know in the 19th century. But in the 20th century we found in some papers discovered in a library the fact that Robert Harley, the, one of the leading ministers in England, knew that Defoe was one of the best writers he could hire. Harley was Tory, and Harley was Anglican, but he hired Defoe to write for him. And he got him out of jail. Defoe's purpose was to mitigate the criticism of the government in Whig journals. Now you may say, why would anyone submit to this sentence and turn against his friends? But Defoe had to get out of prison. And so while he would criticize the government, he would, in some instances, he would mute his criticism. Although we find plenty of criticism in the review and others of his publications. He also was selected to go into Scotland. England had not, was not part of Scotland at this time. They were going to unite in 1707. And Harley needed someone to spy out avenues or areas where there were protests against the union of Scotland and England. And they sent uh, Defoe into Scotland and he would report to Harley where groups of politicians were going to be outspoken against the union. And Harley could either bribe them or could in some ways counter this attack. Uh, we know that Defoe was in Scotland because he wrote letters to Harley asking why he hadn't been paid for some of the work he had been doing. Well, this is a fascinating figure, this Daniel Defoe. And we're going to look at one more item that we have to study before the day ends. In 1705, Defoe wrote a true relation of the apparition, apparition of one Mrs. Veal the next day after her death to one Mrs. Bargrave at Canterbury the 8th of September 1705. Now there's some debate whether someone told Defoe the story but all the traits of the story are Defoe's in, in style. <clears throat> First of all we assume it's a fiction. Two close friends, Mrs. Bargrave and Mrs. Veal, have occasion to know each other and to know each other's problems as they are married and living apart from each other, but the husbands and wives are living together themselves. And one day Mrs. Bargrave is at home on September 8th at noon, 
when Mrs. Veal comes to visit her. And they have a conversation for about 45 minutes. And Mrs. Veal has to depart. Only seven days later does Mrs. Bargrave learn that Mrs. Veal had died at noon one day earlier than her visit to Mrs. Bargrave. And the question is, what had happened? Now, we understand from the story that when Mrs. Veal met Mrs. Bar came to Mrs. Bargrave's home and entered the home, they never touched. There was action, there was movement. But Defoe is very careful to maintain a distance that we don't suspect until the end of the story to learn that they've never touched. They couldn't have touched if Mrs. Veal was an apparition of a dead woman. And Defoe maintains a certain element of distance in establishing this fiction. But no one writes better fiction than Defoe, because what he always does is set up a story, and then we're always anticipating what's happening next, what's going to happen next, what are we going to discover next. He always holds us off. And it's, it's a rather remarkable piece of writing. First of all, it's first-person narrative. The narrator is talking about what he has heard. And we have intensive detail. Let's look at that story for a moment and see what kind of detail you get. Whenever you write or you write stories, you want to come up with this level of detail. Mrs. Veal was a maiden gentlewoman of about 30 years of age. By the way, it wasn't uncommon for someone to die at the age of 30 or 35 in this period. I've already mentioned to you that at least 25% of husbands, wives, aunts, and uncles were dead uh, by 30 or 35. Now you must know that Mrs. Veal was a maiden gentlewoman of about 30 years of age and for some years past had been troubled with fits which were perceived coming on her by her going off from her discourse very abrupt, abruptly to some impatience. So she was having attacks. She was maintained by an only brother who, and kept his house in Dover. She was a very pious woman and a brother, a very sober man to all appearance. But now he does all he can to now and quash the story. Mrs. Veal was intimately acquainted with Mrs. Bargrave from her childhood. Mrs. Veal's circumstances were then mean. Her father did not take care of his children as he ought so that they were exposed to hardships. And Mrs. Bargrave in those days had a, as unkind a father, though she wanted neither f for food nor clothing, while Mrs. Veal wanted for both. So now we have Mrs. Bargrave being very, very friendly, very helpful to Mrs. Veal, who suffered po impoverishment, suffered lack of clothing, food, And we find out that there are relationships Mrs. Bargrave then on the 8th of September 1705 was sitting alone in the forenoon thinking over her unfortunate life and arguing herself into a due resignation to providence when there's a knock at the door knocking at the door she went to see who was there. And this proved to be Mrs. Veal, her old friend, who was in a writing habit. Now look at the details. The details are really quite particular. Mrs. Veal says, I gave my brother the slip and came away because I had so great a mind to see you before I took a journey. She doesn't tell her what journey she's on. But we know at the end of the story what journey she's on. She is seeking death. <clears throat> 
Uh, Madam, says Mrs. Bargrave, I'm surprised to see you. You've been so long a stranger. Mrs. Veal almost touched her with her lips. They were going to kiss, and we see till the lips almost touched. But they don't touch. The reason they don't touch is because they can't touch. One is in the spiritual world, one is in the real world. And Defoe holds off that kiss, just that distance, to make us wonder what's happening. No one tells a story better than Defoe. Mrs. Bargrave says, how can you take a journey alone? How can you take a journey alone? Well, in death you are alone on your journey. So Mrs. Bargrave went in with her into another room and Mrs. Veal sat down in an elbow chair. Then says Mrs. Veal, my dear, I am come to renew our old friendship and beg your pardon for my breach of it for not having seen you for so long. And so you get this warm relationship between two people who have known each other, one of whom has helped the other, both of whom have had difficult times, and one of whom is about to go on a journey. They talk about the books they've read. They've read Charles Drelincourt's book upon death, The Christian Defense Against the Fears of Death, published in 1675, Consolation de l'âme fidèle contre la frayeur de la mort. Uh, someone says that Defoe actually came out with an edition of this book of his own in, uh, in 1705. And one theory is that he wrote this story in order to interest people in his edition of Charles Drelincourt's book. They talk about another book they read. William Sherlock's A Practical Discourse Concerning Death published in 1689. And the story is about death, friendship, and one of the great mysteries ever written. Defoe's story of the apparition of Mrs. Veal. I hope you enjoy reading this material. Take care.